Thank you. Um, is, we have about 20 minutes, and it'd be nice to have a discussion. So I'll open the floor. Um, I'd perhaps like to make one request, as it were, or, or one sort of substantive request and one uh, logistical one. The substantive request has to do with joining this conversation to some of the conversations we were having in the workshops yesterday. And I think, in a way, one of the things the panel has done is actually brought out one kind of divide in think tanks that I think we should talk about more. And the way of thinking about this divide is the following, which is, uh, there are think tanks that are working on structured problems, then there are think tanks that are, in a sense, not only working on unstructured problems, but I think the circumstances in a lot of developing countries are that we are working on what Weber and Rittel many years ago called wicked problems, uh, which have very specific characteristics. There are think tanks trying to initiate broader political change versus think tanks that are taking a settled political system or administrative uh, policy process for granted and working in those contexts. There are think tanks that can take a background normative consensus for granted. And then there are think tanks that are actually trying to, in a sense, push the boundaries of a normative consensus or actually sometimes creating a new normative consensus. And what would be nice if from the floor comments, we can actually have some comments that address, in a sense, both kinds of, uh, of, 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 of challenges. Um, so with that, um, I just request you to be as brief as uh, possible so that we can get as many uh, questions in. Uh, in the interest of time, we'll just collect a few and then ask the panelists to respond. So floor is, floor is open. Devapriya, I'm keeping note. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> good morning, everybody. Thank you, Pratap, for the floor. Uh, I would like to compliment all the three presentat presentators and also the discussants intervention. Um, taking cue from what you have said, there's three distinction you have made between those who are working on structural problems versus in the unstructured situation, uh, those working for broad change and those who are in a settled uh, socio-political uh, paradigm, and then the normative uh, given or not given. So from that point of view, and if you are discussing successful uh, think tanks, then if your chances of success is more if you are working in a permeable circumstances, and the highest permeability is when you work not only within the system, but within the political party. So the point I'm raising here, that those think tanks, which are not necessarily, quote unquote, autonomous and independent, but those who believe in a certain political ideology and who are embedded in the political parties themselves, won't they be more successful than many others who are loitering around in search of their champions? Mm -hmm. So what is the experience over there? Those have been more successful in bringing about changes, or those who wanted to look for a constituency, look for a change, leadership has been more successful ultimately. Thank you. Thank you. There was a hand up there, yes. Merci beaucoup. I, I speak in French. If you can take your earphones. Merci beaucoup. Euh, je voudrais insister sur euh, l'importance qu'il y a à avoir euh, une bonne capacité euh, de recherche, une bonne capacité d'analyse. Euh, il me semble que, à moins et long terme, on ne peut pas avoir de l'influence si on n'est pas en mesure d'apporter à chaque fois des idées euh, qui permettent aux décideurs d'y voir un peu plus clair, si je puis dire. Et je crois qu'un autre aspect aussi, une fois qu'on a cette capacité, c'est euh, savoir saisir les opportunités. On peut être pendant un certain moment dans une situation où il est extrêmement difficile d'avoir de l'influence et de l'impact. Et un beau jour, il y a une fenêtre qui s'ouvre, si je puis dire, et on peut en profiter pour euh, 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 faire des euh, pas de géant à ce qui concerne euh, l'influence euh, sur les politiques. Et ceci m'amène à dire que l'investissement sur le long terme, c'est important. Euh, L'impact, ce n'est pas simplement, à mon avis, euh, euh, d'apparaître régulièrement dans les médias, de, de, de discuter de tout et de rien, 
mais c'est aussi être vraiment capable, euh, sur certaines questions, euh, d'apporter des idées euh, qui permettent euh, aux acteurs, ou à certains acteurs au moins, de voir un peu plus clair et, et, et de euh, progresser. Je vous remercie. Thanks. Uh, maybe we'll take a couple more in this round at the back there. And, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Goran uh, Bouvier's Think Tank Fund from the Open Society Foundation. So uh, one comment, two questions. Uh, the comment is that I heard you using a sort of ranking of University of Pennsylvania. I don't know how much that's uh, relevant for Africa. As someone who works with European and Eastern European think tanks, I find it as a very dangerous tool to use it as a reference, and especially when it comes to impact and quality of think tanks. Uh, in Eastern Europe, both uh, uh, in terms of research methodology that the ranking is used and in, in uh, the way of how the ranking functions, it's completely misleading about the impact and the quality of the, of the think tank. So I will be very wary about using the, uh, the, the ranking. Um, the questions are, um, I have a question for the panel. I, I was really intrigued by your discussion and saying the incremental change, and I kept on wondering with all the changes that we saw in the last year, to what extent focusing on incremental change puts think tanks on the wrong side of the equation. Uh, meaning in many societies, uh, even if they don't want to be, how they eventually they end up in the eyes of, of people, of general population, as supporters to the authoritarian regime. Uh, even if their ideological, intellectual uh, uh, ideas are, are different than that. As we know, image is, is different. And then the second question is related to civil society. Um, I really would like to learn more about the think tanks in the regions where you cover. Uh, in Eastern Europe, there is an issue where the think tanks want to take a distance of civil society. And I think it's, the, it's uh, a lot to their peril. And I would like to, to in a way, uh, hear and listen more about how that... Uh, in a way, improves or impedes their chances to have success uh, uh, in, the, in the policy process. So there are links yeah. to civil society. Okay, we'll take one last question in this round, Professor Thorat. Well, thank you. Uh, I think it was a very, very exciting and insightful presentation. Uh, I have one comment and maybe then uh, speaker can clarify, and that is an issue on demand side, uh, demand for policy. I think the success of a think tank, uh, even in a muddy political atmosphere, and some political leader you have on your side and others do not have, uh, which Professor Bhattacharya has mentioned, but there is constant demand on the part of the government for a policy, because there is a continuous process of issues there. And therefore, I think the success of the think tank depends on the fact that how quickly they identify the demand for policy, that is, recognize the issue, develop a policy uh, which government is expecting to develop. So, and there is, there is little scope for compromise then. The government is, has an option, they have their alternative, but then think tank three and better quality research is coming with the solutions. And I think the creditability of think tank based on research can always be that these are the causes that comes to the research and these are the solution. But whether those policy suggestions can be implemented in a given political and cultural sphere and issues of governance, uh, I think the capacity of uh, NGO to recommend an appropriate policy is the one which is implementable. So I think as we say in economics, what NGO has to possibly do is to go for a second best and not for the first best. They may be aware that this is the best, but the political situation, other situation would not allow to have that. So I think success of the uh, NGO will depend, acceptance of policy will depend on the fact that they are giving a policy which is feasible and implementable. Thank you. Uh, may I now invite the panelists to pick on any one of the questions they'd like to answer. You don't have to feel compelled to answer all of them, but just any <laughs> general comments. Uh, so maybe we'll start with Nancy and then move down. Uh, well, <clears throat> I think there's a, it's too easy for me to answer some of these questions given the context in which um, my center works in Washington. So uh, just saying that it's easy 
is acknowledging what many have been saying, which is the context in which you're working matters so much, how structured it is, how permeable it is, and so on. But, but my reaction on, to some of the questions is, it, to the extent possible, it's worth trying to have a portfolio. And let me give the example from the center of uh, work of a colleague on migration. Um, starting at least almost from the beginning of the center, and we're just about 10, or 10 years old, my view was that one of the best ways for people to escape poverty is for them to be able to move across borders. And this is not considered really fundamental in the development, in development circles. I spent 20 years at the multilateral institutions, the World Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank, and with some justification, all the effort is on transforming societies defined by sovereign, by national boundaries. Um, at the same time, you could see in the United States that uh, there were tremendous benefits in my country from having, being a country of immigration. Benefits to the US and benefits to the countries from which people came because of the transfer of ideas, not just remittances, but ideas, influence, and changing norms around the world. So, so one of our scholars began working on migration. It was very far in one direction, unstructured, very much about norms. Then, and he did, he's done amazing work. I encourage any of you who are interested to go to our website and learn about it, including that there isn't any such thing really as a brain drain. Uh, so then we had the earthquake in ha Haiti uh, two or three years ago. And one of the things that happened is that his name is Michael Clemens. He began thinking about the advantages to Haiti of having some pe people, more people being able to emigrate. And he started writing about the idea for the U.S. So this created an, an opening. There was tremendous attention to the problem of Haiti and tremendous concern in the US about the waste of all the money that was being sent to Haiti through public and private agencies. And Michael started writing about letting in more Haitians. The US doesn't have an economic opportunity visa. It has visas for family members. It has visas for highly skilled people. But it doesn't have, an, and it has visas for political asylum. So he started writing about that. And eventually, a year or two later, he realized that Haiti was not on the list of the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of State for eligibility for temporary workers to come to the US for three years renewable to work mostly in low-skilled areas like agriculture and construction. So he started working. This is the scholar who has changed the way development space, the thinkers in development work on, think about the development problem. He has changed that. At the same time, he just got determined to get Haiti on the list for eligibility. And we, he got people on Capitol Hill, the two senators from Florida, a Republican and a Democrat, to send a letter to the Department of State. He found some immigration lawyers that for a fairly small amount of money started working with all kinds of players and Michael and eventually like this and like this, talking to many people, Hillary Clinton, staff, etc. he got Haiti on the list for eligibility. And now he is working to make sure that this is, now one of the things he says is if 2,000 more emigrants could come from Haiti to the US within five or 10 years. Their remittances alone would exceed threefold or something like that, the amount of foreign aid going from the US to Haiti. So I'm sorry to tell a long story, but the, con the idea is that he captured a portfolio in, in his own work, starting very much on the normative unstructured side and ending very much on a tiny, you could think of it as an incremental fix to US immigration policy. But if after the next natural disaster in a low-income country, 
there is a possibility, because Haiti is there, to get another country on. And if we could, in my country, eventually have the concept of an op economic opportunity visa, well, that would be a major change, I believe, in, uh, in the, the way the development space is structured and in lives for, for the, in bet, leading to better lives for millions of people. Thank you. It's extraordinary story, Frank. Sorry. Um, I think Nancy brought a very powerful example which uh, would help uh, me uh, respond to two, maybe three comments that were made. Uh, one is that uh, when you have many think tanks or you have big ones that can have multiple people to take different perspectives, it allows the think tanks over time to have impact, uh, even in a very complex political environment. So I think the size is one, but size doesn't have to be in one single think tank. It could be distributed in, in a number of think tanks. And the other one that uh, we have learned is when think tanks can work regionally. So you find, for instance, uh, IDEG works in Liberia, and uh, they can transfer ideas from Ghana to Liberia because Liberia has low capacity and, and in the interim uh, you can have uh, results uh, uh, even with capacity from other countries. Um, on the questions of uh, whether think tanks that are in more permeable environments are more successful, from the evaluations that we have done, and this is independent of the University of Pennsylvania rankings, this is an independent evaluation, it, it actually goes across. There are think tanks that have had tremendous impact in very complex environments, partly because of uh, sp narrowing down to specific issues and working them through, taking uh, opportunity when there are one or two people who can move the agenda in terms of implementation. But the one thing I can say is that not a single think tank that has been successful has been completely independent of government because you have to get your ideas to be implemented. Otherwise, they remain uh, ideas for debate, but they don't usually make their way to change. The few that have been able to have change without being involved with government have had a huge public space, a forum through the media, through civil society where the ideas are debated and kept alive until a person or a government comes in place and then moves and implements them. So I think the key to success is keeping the ideas alive over a period of time. In, in Liberia, the think tank was dormant for eight years if you look at it from the point of view of policy impact. But in terms of research and ideas, and I think I come to the point raised about having good quality research it is absolutely important to have research and analysis. But the weakness for most of, our, of the countries in which we work is data. So here is really a plea for those who support think tanks to also support data, data collection analysis, because data is one of the big gaps that prevents this quality research from, uh, from being done. And that's not necessarily numeric data but also collecting of successful case studies, but over a long period of time so that people can see the change. And then the last comment on the, um, on the CSOs and the relationship to think tanks. Uh, we find a very healthy relationship between them, but it can be separate. In fact, most of the think tanks in Africa are registered as civil society organizations. So the distinction sometimes is very difficult to make between a think tank and a CSO. In fact, we classify them under civil society, including academia, the media, and so on, that form the broader civil society. So I think that the, it's very difficult to distinguish. But in any case, even if a think tank is classified otherwise, it's in its, in its interest to bring in civil society because civil society has the advantage over long periods of time to ride the waves of shifting political and, and economic priorities. Okay, Andrea, quickly, and then Matthias. Um, yeah, well, um, I'll touch on the, on, on the issue of the structuring of, of problems. Uh, one of the things we were also looking into was um, how is it that think tanks help uh, reframe problems that are 
uh, originally very unstructured towards ones that are uh, more structured. So that, that, that's part of the job that think tanks uh, carry out. And, and in the cases, we see the same thing, that there are very unstructured problems that think tanks are able to reframe in a way of, uh, of a small uh, concrete fix, as Nancy puts it. Uh, what is interesting to, and what we were worried is this uh, idea that that fix will solve that problem. You know, you have to be conscious that that fix is going to be like a small part of solving it. And so in this context, uh, where as our colleague mentioned, it's the second best solution, uh, think tanks uh, will usually have to keep working on finding uh, more long-term or, or longer uh, term solutions. So that's the one side on restructuring the problems. Uh, but then the other one, and this one um, might touch upon uh, being on the wrong side, as Goran mentioned, is that we were also thinking on when is it that think tanks must deconstruct those problems that are already well, well established and, and well set in society. And for that, we reviewed a little bit of what think tanks uh, did in Chile uh, to prepare themselves for the end of dictatorship. And so that, that, that was a government that was very structured, that was uh, well-functioning in, in some aspects. But that uh, think tanks were able to create a space for other political actors to come in and start thinking about how they were going to deconstruct that scenario. So that's also a space where, where think tanks can, can participate. Um, and in, the, in case with the relationship with, with civil society, um, I cannot talk for the entire Latin American region, but for m probably only for some cases I know in Ecuador. And I think that what is crucial for a good relationship between think tanks and, and, and civil society, and I, I agree with Franny that we also are like very, very similar. We're also constituted most of the times as civil society organizations legally. But what we need for a good relationship with civil society, I think, is more transparency in terms of our agenda, what is it that we're pushing for. That's, those are things that civil society want to understand, that they want to see more clearly to engage with, with think tanks and, and the research they carry out. Matthias, you want to last yeah. word quickly? What I would like to comment on is um, the, the frame of from product to process. I think you mentioned that, Andrea. And I think um, the colleague thinking about the relation between party and or political, political organization and think tanks, as well as the colleague that's, that was touching on seizing the moment and windows of opportunity, both, both are hinting that probably for think tanks, it's very important to think about the process. And as most of them would come from, from academic background, they think about it in terms of papers and products. So, um, I think that leads a lot towards thinking about the communication strategy, but also the internal um, self-esteem and the um, idea what we want from, from us and from the organization as um, the think tank. So um, the phrase thinking from product to process helps a lot to um, carve out that strategy and that um, self-perspective each think tank has to develop for himself, for, for itself. Okay, uh, unfortunately we are under the tyranny of time, uh, so we have to bring this uh, panel to a close. It's been an extraordinary example of uh, not just very clear analysis, uh, but really some inspiring examples uh, and stories, and so I'd like to thank all the panelists for uh, really um, uh, enriching us, and I think in some ways actually, you know, they've sort of brought together uh, so many different strands that we've been talking about over the last day or so. So we are deeply grateful. Thanks very much. Peter, are there any other announcements? You or